Happy Sabbath to you. <laughs> I'm just going to say a little quick word to my wife and our baby, Kaylee. Happy Sabbath to you. <laughs>
scripture reading will be found in Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteousness, with my righteous right hand. Uh, I'm very thankful to God because he did something marvelous this week in the life of my dad. He providentially, uh, my dad suffers with, or he had been suffering with a genetic disorder called PKD, which is called polycystic kidney disease. And this disease, he was born with it. His kidneys were born with little cysts, and as time progresses, they get bigger, and they pop sometimes, and they, it just keeps growing, and the kidney just continues to grow and grow and grow until they, be, they become like monstrous kidneys. And it came to the point that my dad's kidneys were only working at uh, less than 10%. So this week, uh, my dad had a kidney transplant. And it, my, the donor was my uncle. And uh, I'm just amazed that just what hap has happened in a week, my dad's life has transformed. And he looks like he's, you know, like five years younger. And uh, he looks so happy and he looks so healthy. And I just want to praise God because, um, because uh, he's doing well now and he has another chance at life. And I'm very, very happy, and uh, I want to bless God's name because uh, he's answered our prayers, and he's uh, worked in this way. And I also want to begin with prayer, so join me as we pray. Dear Father, I just want to praise you because you're so good, and you're so awesome. You, you listen to us. When we come to you with a sincere heart and you're ready, willing, and able to come to our aid and you come in different ways and it's just so awesome how you've worked in my life recently. And today, Lord, I want to pray that this message, that it could be relevant. I pray that this message could glorify you. And uh, as the song, the first song we sang said, Lord, I'm not good enough. And I ask, Savior, please, save me, and may you be glorified today, Father. Hide me behind your cross, and may the message be clearly perceived, and may it be practical for our life this week and for the rest of our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hasn't science progressed in, a, in an incredible way? Like, I just, just thinking about my dad and how God worked through the physician's hands and how God worked through uh, my uncle and donating his kidney and how the, the physicians were able to uh, just put everything together and uh, God, like, enlighten their minds, the physician's minds, to figure out that my uncle was actually a match and then actually take his kidneys, take my uncle's kidney, one of his kidneys, and take out my dad's kidneys and put that, my uncle's kidney, into my dad's body. And for him to have another opportunity at life, it, it just amazes me how science has progressed over time. But isn't it true, is, is it possible that science could be, you know, somewhat of a curse sometimes? Uh, the reason why I ask this is because recently I read an article well, actually, I was, just to tell you the background story, I was browsing to, through Amazon one day, and I saw a title of a book called, This Will Make You Smarter. And immediately, I wanted to buy that book because, you know, I want to be smarter. But as I was browsing through some of these articles in this book, I began to be challenged in my faith. Because there were very um, intellectual evolutionists in these articles. And one article in particular, particular uh, talked about, one, one article in particular talked about how we as human beings 
We're special. We're special. Not because, and, and we need to find our, and we as human beings, we need to find that we are special, we are relevant, we uh, have purpose in life. Not because there is a God, but we have a purpose and we are relevant and we are special because we are so scientifically advanced than any other creature. We as human beings need to realize that we are amazing because there's no one else like us in all the universe. And we need to come to the realization that, yes, we are al- we, science hasn't advanced enough to find out that there's life anywhere else and we need to find self-sufficiency and realize that we are great people, that we're awesome, but there's nothing else out there. What do you guys think about that? Why has science been so good at doing away with the presence of God in our lives? Have you reasoned in your mind that God isn't present in your life? Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 23. What book did I say? Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 2. 23. And when you're there, say amen. 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 The Bible says, Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth. This verse right here significantly does away with the thoughts of that there's nobody out there. And not only that there's nobody out there, but it talks about the reality that there not only is someone out there, but this this someone is here with us. But what about in the life of Joseph? Was God present in the life of Joseph? Let, come with me on the journey of Joseph's life in, in Genesis chapter 39. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and I hope that this uh, sermon today can help us realize that God is working in our lives, just how He worked in the life of Joseph. So, Genesis 39, starting from verse 1. Everyone have it? Awesome. The verse, first verse says what? Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. Can you imagine Joseph in the slave market? He's about to be bought as a slave. Look at his tear-stained cheeks. He remembers the previous moments of his life because he was the favorite son of Jacob. And he had visions that he would one day rule over his family. And do you remember that coat that covered his body? It's a colorful coat made with the finest linen. And uh, his brothers all wanted one. Hey, Joseph, nice coat, Simeon said, one of Joseph's brothers. What? Dad never gave me a coat like that. See, having a coat like that displayed wealth, riches, 
prestige, class, and royalty. And Joseph was the only one out of his brothers to have one. Why do you always get the good stuff, Joseph? You see, this coat produced jealousy in his brothers. A jealousy that eventually they would even think of killing him for or even or stealing from him. You see, not only was Joseph spoiled, but he annoyed his brothers. It got to the point that they, his brothers could not even say a nice word to him. And they didn't want him to be around them. So, you know what? First, they thought they would kill him. They stripped him off his Armani coat and left him in a pit. But as they saw a group of Ishmaelite brothers, they said in Genesis 30, 37, verse 26, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. For he's our brother and our flesh and his brothers were content with that idea. So what did they do? They trapped bro their brother Joseph and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels. Joseph was a prince in his dreams. But now shackles were binding him as he crossed the desert into the unpromised land. In the distance, he could see the place that he, would, that he once called home, and tears came down his face because he never knew if he would ever see his father again. What would you feel if you were in that situation? What do you do if you're enslaved against your own will? Do you allow yourself to fall into a deep depression or anxiety? Do you, do you think, man, why has God abandoned me? Maybe you might lose your desire to even live because your dreams are shattered. As far as you know, your goals in life are not going to happen. And you fall into a deep depression. I pray that the words of Scripture may encourage you right now. As it says in Psalm 37, verses 23 to 25, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. I've been young and now I'm old, and I have not seen the righteous man forsaken or his descendants begging for bread. Psalm 37. Look what Isaiah 41 says. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will help you. I will uphold you. I will strengthen you with my righteous right hand. Have you stopped to think that maybe God allows us to go through things, through different situations in our life so that He could mold us into the person that He wants us to be? Maybe He wants you to realize, to be still and realize that He's right there with you, no matter what you're going through. Could this have happened in the life of Joseph? A man named Potiphar pops up in the slave market. Providentially, it's him. He's, and he's not just any person. He's an officer of Pharaoh. The, uh, the next few verses in chapter 9 tells us. He's an officer of Pharaoh. And Potiphar, as he's looking through the slave market and he sees Joseph, he sees that there's something different about him. I don't know what it is. It's, 
Could it be his posture? Could it be the little twinkling of, it, of his eye that demonstrates some sort of wisdom, some supernatural being must be with him? There's something about him that catches his eye and he analyzes him and he sees that his very presence inspires peace. Something about him shows that he's humble and there's a passion in him that is rarely seen. Immediately, Potiphar says, you know what, this is the guy. I'll take him. Could it be that this was a divine appointment? That God was there with Joseph, guiding the every move of Potiphar, and just and Joseph being brought down at that very moment? Who's to know that Potiphar was to go grocery shopping that day or to do something else, and somebody else would have came and bought Joseph? You see, the Lord was with Joseph, and he had a plan for Joseph. At first, the Egyptian master, he, he keeps an eye on his investment. He wants to make sure that everything that Joseph does is right and good. But as time progresses, he realizes that, you know what, Joseph, he, he needs a space because what, I, I, I don't need to watch over him anymore. I don't need to micromanage him anymore because everything that he does prospers and succeeds. It's like everything almost touches to gold when Joseph touches it. And you know what? Every, ever since Joseph is in, my, in Potiphar's house, things are great. The house seems safe. The house is clean. It's organized. The, slaves, the other slaves are, are happy. There's structure. There's unity. There's peace. And you know what? It's not long before Potiphar makes Joseph o over all of he, everything that he owns. And you know what? It comes to the point that Potiphar can even leave his house and not worry about anything. Because you know what? Joseph is in command. And you know what? All that hard work paid off. All that hard work that Joseph did in the house, you know, cleaning, working out in the field, it all paid off because, you know, he started to get a six-pack, you know, and his muscles began to get firm. And he started to get popular. His six-pack was almost the best in all of Egypt. He even made the cover of GQ magazine. And you know what? All the single ladies were checking him out. Not only the single ladies, even the taken ladies, too. Particularly Mrs. Potiphar. She couldn't keep her eyes off Joseph. She started Facebook stalking him and started looking at all his pictures and liking them. Wow, she said. She reminds me of Potiphar back in the day. If I could just get my hands on him, she thought. Soon, her thoughts drove her to her action. The Bible says that she said to him, Come, Joseph, come and lie with me. Potiphar won't be here for a long time. Nobody will know. Come and lie with me now. What would you have done? Here's Joseph with his master's wife. She owns this slave. She tells him what to do, and he is to obey her every command. What do you do? 
Do you heed to temptation this once? Do you persuade yourself in saying that she's my master, I have to do what she says? What temptations do you have in your life? Maybe it's lying in your taxes. I know I have that temptation. To pay less or get more. Maybe uh, you're in line at Mayer's. And maybe you're in line at Mayer's and, and you're married. And you can't help but let your eyes wander in the wrong places. Maybe you're playing a game of basketball and your opponent has the ball, and you have the opportunity to foul him when the, when the referee isn't looking. What keeps you from making that move? What keeps you from falling into those traps? Well, let's see what Joseph did. Genesis 39.8. Verse 8 says, But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He's not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see, Joseph was was away from home. But he, Joseph was away from home, but he understood that he was not away from God's presence. What, ca- what kept Joseph from sinning is his love and desire to be in God's presence. You see, Joseph was empowered by the presence of God. Amen? Joseph was empowered by the presence of God. And the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph. But you know what? Temptation kept pressing on because she kept pressing on. On and on she went. Over and over she kept tempting Joseph. Day after day she would command him, Joseph, come and lie with me. Like a persistent salesman at the door, she can't take no for an answer. And she's just being consumed by this idea of being with Joseph. And one day, she decided that's it. It's going to happen. Conveniently, Mr. Potiphar was gone. And all the workers were gone from the home. And it was only Joseph in the house, cleaning up, doing his daily activities. But no one else was there. And she decided, you know what? I'm going to make Joseph sleep with me. And you know what? She trapped him. She had him cornered. She grabbed his shirt. And she said, lie with me. Have you ever had that? Have you ever had a moment in your life where you felt like you almost had no choice but to sin? But to make the wrong choice? We live in a world where fornication, adultery, and all kinds of temptations are hurled at us. In Facebook and Twitter, people post revealing pictures of themselves for sport. Pop-ups come on your computer screen. What keeps you from making your imagination run wild? What keeps you from doing any other thing? These might not be your temptations, But maybe what keeps you from making the mistake of having pride or uh, 
putting yourself first before other people. Look at Joseph's response in verse 12. Look at Joseph's verse, response in verse 12. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in his hand and fled and got out of the house. So Joseph, what Joseph did is, at, when she grabbed him, she, he did a 360 and ran out of the house faster than Usain Bolt. You see, Joseph ran fast out of that temptation because he realized that even though he was away from home, he was not away from God's presence. Joseph was empowered by God's presence. You know, Joseph would rather have died than to disobey God. He chooses to be embarrassed and even shirtless in front of everyone rather than to be embarrassed and naked in front of God, in the presence of God. And in, if we look at verses 13 through 15, Mrs. Potiphar is not happy with the decision that he made. She thought her evil device would work, but it didn't. And Joseph got away. And she gets to the point and she says, she looks down at her hands and she sees that her, his shirt is in his hands. And she says, servants, servants. Read with me here in verse 15. Oh, here it is right here, verse 14. She called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her, by her until her, his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came into me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. And verse 19, As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And there he was in prison. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. And we see that temptation and evil was happening in the life of Joseph. But we realize that no matter what, Joseph would rather be in God's presence than to be pushed away from God's presence. Because Joseph was empowered by the presence of God. And I'm convinced to believe that Joseph was happy, would rather be happy in God's presence than sad with, by making the wrong choice. But if God was with him, how could he let this happen to him? Why didn't Joseph just forsake God and live his own life? In fact, God wasn't with him, right? No one would, would have found out if he would have made the wrong choice, right? Right? And now here he is in prison, alone and discouraged maybe. But like Daniel in the lion's den, like the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace, like Peter who was crucified upside down, and the millions of Christians who were persecuted in the dark ages for their faith, and the remnant church in the last days, they rather die than to deny God's presence in their lives. 
they rather be dishonored by men than to dishonor their best friend Jesus. Joseph was, mot- was not motivated by earthly gain or riches. I'm, I am convinced that Joseph was not motivated by political power or, um, or to have heavy influence. I'm convinced that Joseph was motivated by a beautiful relationship with God because Joseph was empowered by the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 21 in chapter 29, 39, I'm sorry. It says it again, and it says it over and over in this chapter. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. You see, Joseph was away from home, but he was not away from God's presence. And that was what fueled Joseph's life. And that relationship, God demonstrated a great deal of love. And that is where Joseph found fulfillment. And that is where Joseph found purpose in his life. And we all know the rest of the story, that Joseph becomes, at the end of the story, he becomes one of the greatest in all of Egypt. And God uses him to do mighty things. I, uh, I want to tell, end with this story about this child and his father. This child and his father, are at, they're at the supermarket. And his dad, the father, is trying to get all the groceries. And the child starts saying, don't stand so tall, dad. Don't, st- don't, tan- don't stand so tall. And the dad just keeps walking and he continues to put uh, food articles in the cart. And the kid starts crying and he says, Dad, don't stand so tall. Don't stand so tall. And at that moment, the, the father realizes that the son wants to tell him something. So he gets down to his son's level. And with tears in his eyes, the little kid says, He touches his dad's face and he says, I love you, daddy. And his dad says, I love you too, son. I love you too. And right after that, his dad gets up and he starts walking again and doing his groceries. And his son has a smile on his face because his father just told him that he loved him. And he followed his every father's footsteps. He only needed the assurance of those special words, I love you. He wanted to know for sure that his dad loved him. You know, God showed his love for us when he came down to this earth. And he showed his love for us on that cross. You know, and to walk in his footsteps is not difficult when we realize how great His love is for us. And, when we de- and as we see that love, we develop a passion to walk in His footsteps. I was asking God this morning to really he- help me in this sermon and to make, it, to make it practical, to make it actually relevant and to help it change our lives today. And I was asking God, how could I make this practical? How could this make us fall more in love with God? And I'm convinced that if we spend every day meditating for a few minutes on God's love for us and realizing that He loves us, just thinking about meditating on a verse of Scripture like Jeremiah chapter 29, when he says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you, or John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and beautiful scriptures like that, if we just take a moment to meditate on those, ver- on those verses and make them a reality in our lives, I'm convinced that we will know that God loves us. And we will fall more in love with God 
and we'll be more willing to feel, or we, we, we won't be more willing, but as we do that, we will feel God's presence more in our lives. And I just want, want you to know that Jesus invites you today to live in his presence. He loves you too much to leave you alone. And he wants you to always be with him. Will you live in his presence the way Joseph did? If you accept this challenge for this week, spend 20 minutes every day meditating on a verse and thinking about how God loves you. If you accept this challenge, I want you to say to your neighbor, I want you to say, I would say to your neighbor, God is with me. <laughs> say, say, say it to your neighbor, God is with me. Awesome. Now you're forced to study the Bible for this week. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much that we had the opportunity to spend time in the, in the life of Joseph. And realize that even though he went through really difficult times in his life, we know that you were with him because your word tells us. And just like you were in the life of Joseph, we know that you are in our life. And you want to uphold us. You want to strengthen us. And you want to take us to the next level of spirituality and of purpose in our life. So guide us, Father. Help us to love you with all our hearts, mind and soul. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.